Um, so I'm very informal. So uh, now we all uh, know each other. So uh, feel free to reach out to me, um, ask questions. I'm always curious to get people's input and uh, see what research questions they have. We have these amazing resources. You guys are um, all taxpayers and, and residents and um, um, participants in, in poultry. So however, you guys pay my salary at some level. So however I can help you, please let me know. And uh, I'll, at the minimum, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, so um, just very briefly, um, I, I know Julie and Rebecca and, and Brooke and Teresa kind of mentioned this, but I just want to mention what cooperative extension is because I've done you know, a decent amount of work around the world. And, and the one thing I have learned in the past is that um, there are a lot of universities around the world, um, which are amazing kind of uh, locations for innovation and teaching and things like that. But we don't have this extension system that we have in the United States around the world. And extension is really kind of this middleman. And it's our job um, to really work with uh, farmers and the public in order to make sure that the best research is getting to the public. So I focus on poultry. So it's my job to make sure that the research I do is really applied and practical and that um, I'm working with um, um, people um, who are farming and trying to make food and making sure that that food is safe and nutritious and all those kind of good things. Um, we've got an amazing uh, system in California. Um, so I did wanna highlight that uh, we have over 200 advisors throughout the state and specialists all kind of uh, strategically located in all these different offices. Um, so when you look at our, our website, um, the UCA and our website, you'll, you'll see all those different types of advisors and specialists and offices and, and information that, that you guys have access to. So um, like I said, uh, feel, don't, don't be a stranger if you have questions in, in all kinds of areas, not just poultry, but uh, you know, livestock and plants and nutrition and 4-H uh, and education and, and all those good things. So um, anyway, we have a, a UC Cooperative Extension poultry website, um, changed a little, but, but the main aspects of it are the same. And I just want to highlight just a couple things on there for you. Uh, one is uh, who to contact um, um, in case of poultry issues. Um, so we have all kinds of experts throughout the state. So if you have problems with ectoparasites, you can ask me, but you could also reach out to uh, Dr. Geary at UC Riverside. So if you scroll down, once you're on that who to contact page, you'll find his contact information. Um, if you have individual questions about your backyard birds, um, we have a list of local veterinarians that self-report as treating backyard poultry, or you can talk to me um, and I can try to point you in the right direction or help you out. Um, so you've got all these great resources. Uh, I also wanted to highlight this CAFS Diagnostic Lab. So if you have sick birds or dead birds and you want to figure out what um, they died from, we have four of these California Animal Health and Food Safety Labs throughout the state. And for a minimal fee of $20, um, they will do a necropsy of uh, up to two birds um, per submission. And uh, the whole goal is if you have 100 birds or 1,000 birds or 10,000 birds, and they're all coughing or wheezing or all have diarrhea or something, you can take one or two of those birds, put them, uh, euthanize them, take them to the calf lab, and then they can figure out maybe what they died from or what's causing them to be ill um, in order to protect the rest of the birds. So we can try to hopefully treat the remainder of the birds. And it's an amazing system. Um, a lot of states have uh, a diagnostic system like, like CAFs. Um, and uh, the reason it's there is to protect our poultry industry uh, from all kinds of diseases, including avian influenza and virulent Newcastle disease. So when you have sick birds, use the CAF system. It's a, it's a great resource. And uh, in some cases, they do literally thousands of dollars of work for uh, a minimal fee of $20. So um, feel free to, to reach out to them. And if you can't find their contact information, I can always help you. Um, so uh, we also have just these quarterly newsletters. Um, and uh, if you go on to our website, um, you can sign up for the quarterly newsletters. And uh, there's all kinds of puzzles in there and games. Uh, but there's also all kinds of information in there about um, uh, maybe uh, events like this or research that we're working on, um, poll, um, um, surveys that you might want to participate in, uh, diseases that we're, you know, want people to be aware of. Um, all of those type of resources are available uh, through that quarterly newsletter. And we have a poultry ponderings newsletter, but we also have a vet med connections newsletter. 
And that vet med connections newsletter um, is uh, um, important because it, it does a non poultry issues also. Uh, I always tell people, you know, this is one of the original versions of poultry ponderings a long, long time ago, but um, you know, here's an article about ectoparasites in uh, backyard chickens in Southern California. And that's Amy Marillo, who was a graduate student when this picture was taken, but now is a, now is a professor at UC Riverside. Um, and she's a poultry entomologist. And uh, they did some work that, that, that showed what are the common types of ectoparasites and how best to treat them in backyard birds in Southern California. And it was published in a journal, uh, an entomology journal, uh, the Journal of Medical Entomology. I, I, so I know not everyone has a subscription or your subscription lapsed to the Journal of Medical Entomology. So in lieu of that, you can just get this newsletter sent to you and it'll summarize basically um, what the results are. So um, you can subscribe to the newsletter very easily. If you can't figure that out, please feel free to reach out to me. And um, so that's what I wanted to chat about as far as just uh, kind of outreach material. There's also a YouTube channel, we have an Instagram page and um, all these other things that um, I think hopefully Myrna, who's a PhD student that I work with can put in the chat box. Um, so I showed you earlier what the UC Davis, kind of that coop that we had developed. Um, and, and now we work on a project. This is out at Russell Ranch, which is near UC Davis, just a couple miles west of campus. And uh, here you can see a, a graduate student, um, not a graduate student, well, a future graduate student, Brock, um, who works in our lab. And uh, we are raising flocks of broilers on um, some pastured land. And then um, once the broilers are processed, um, then um, we, we, we put um, tomatoes or cantaloupe on the land and we, we have these rotational systems. And the reason I wanna highlight is, this is because you know, when a lot of people are farmers, um, they want to kind of dabble in poultry and these kind of pastured or alternative systems are kind of what they want to dabble in. So if they're at a farmer's market, they might not make as much money from the eggs, but I sense they like the eggs. They like the poultry meat because that draws people to their stands. Same thing if they have a CSA box or they're working with restaurants. Restaurants are always asking, yep, we want your vegetables. Um, we want these fruits, whatever you're selling, but we also, you know, would love to have, you know, some uh, pastured meat or some pastured eggs. And, um, you know, I think there's a real opportunity here. We're looking at, you know, kind of somehow um, the poultry fertigate or fertilize the land and we're seeing um, then how the crops do after that and trying to really optimize the economics. Um, but I think there's, you know, in my mind, there's real opportunities here. And these are challenging systems, but there are, California is a very, as we all know, very fertile land and, and real opportunities here to do all kinds of unique things with respect to agriculture. And, you know, when I talk to these kind of alternative farmers, um, while poultry don't seem to be kind of a deal break, they don't seem to be a very profitable enterprise. Like I said, I think from a marketing perspective, it seems like people want to have um, eggs and meat, so they can kind of claim that their their systems are 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 in some kind of homeostasis, and they're they're using the the fertilizer for the crops and the crops for the animals, and and pasture is, is kind of a a middle um, kind of ground in that in that cycle. Um, here's a slide that one of my grad students um, made, who's working, who's kind of the main person in charge of this project. And, um, you know, this really just shows that, um, you know, on these plots of land, um, you can have all types of different rotations uh, in all different types of years. And, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're hoping to work with producers on is really optimizing these, not just from a production perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Um, so these different types of cover crops and plants and chickens and broilers versus layers, um, those are all things that we're really trying to, to optimize. And you know, there's all kinds of different ways to kind of sketch this out, but uh, you know, we're gonna be planting some squash um, very shortly after we our, our chickens were just processed. And then um, after that, we'll go back chickens again and then um, round and round and round. Um, and we're working with collaborators in Iowa and Kentucky to kind of see from the different geographies, what are the best ways to really grow those birds. And like I said, one of the things we're really focusing on is the economics because farmers, 
obviously need to make money. Um, you guys all know that. And it's really important not only that we create systems that are sustainable from an agricultural and environmental perspective, but are also sustainable from an ec from a economic perspective. So I really want to highlight that. And the USDA, to their, to their, to their credit, um, through this OREI, these organic grants that we have, um, through these OREI or other USDA grants, they, they really want the economics integrated into the research. So uh, people like me who are not economists, uh, I need to seek out um, ag economists to help us in order to really understand that, that economic aspect and make sure that the systems that we're advocating for with respect to food safety, with respect to productivity, with respect to nutrition, that they pencil out economically. So really want to highlight that. And that's, I think, a really important aspect that's even in my career really become almost like a front and center type of issue. Um, so why pastured systems? Why alternative systems? So, you know, when I look at, you know, the conventional farm, what you're seeing on the left there is a conventional um, uh, layer facility. And what you're seeing on the right there is this alternative layer facility, this pastured system. And, you know, I think when we look at the pictures, um, you know, there, there's differences there, obviously, right? And, and as a veterinarian who focuses on disease, who's really interested in data and productivity, um, you know, I, I, I look at the systems on the left and I see a lot of advantages. So as someone who um, really focuses on diseases and, and understands and, and studies the interface between wildlife like waterfowl, ducks and geese that are the reservoirs of avian diseases like avian influenza. I look at these systems, I'm like, this is great, right? The waterfowl are not going to get in there. They're not going to transmit disease. Um, when I look at these systems, I, 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 I get a little scared sometimes because I'm like, wow, you know, you're just setting yourself up for, for this disease transmission, for this interface between wildlife and um, um, these domesticated animals. That being said, these systems, um, you know, there's a lot of consumers um, that really enjoy these systems, that love these systems. And my job as a veterinarian, and, and my job as someone who's looking at a lot of these type of data is to really, and work, works with these type of farmers, is not to judge either system, it's really to optimize both systems. So what can we do to reduce disease transmission here? What can we do on these systems to improve welfare? What can we do on these systems to improve food safety, for example? And the list that you're seeing on the left are just all the different things that, that folks like me will focus on to improve productivity, to improve um, productivity, um, economic viability, uh, food safety, all of those type of things. And you know, we can have all kinds of arguments over a beer about which one is better, but to me, that's kind of a moot argument. To me, the most important thing is that each system is optimized as best as possible with respect to every single variable. Um, because consumers, the, the consumers want these, the, some consumers want these, right? So it's our my job not to, to pick winners and losers. It's my job to help the farmers um, do the best that they can. And I, I just wanna point out that there's a lot of different approaches that can be used in order to optimize productivity, which also links to welfare, which also links to food safety, and which also links to economics. And, and these are just some of the ways that we can focus on, for example, um, reducing disease transmission, which is my focus as a veterinarian. Um, regardless, the goal, from a disease perspective at least, is good biosecurity. So we wanna reduce the probability of diseases moving from wildlife into our domestic birds, right? And I promise you, these facilities have a lot of the same problems that these do. There's, there's no, you'd think you look at this and you'd be like, well, there's no waterfowl they're gonna get into those. Uh, so they're not gonna get avian influenza at all. And I promise you that, that for however they're getting in, these diseases move into these facilities. So it really comes down to just doing the best you can with the, with the, with the system that you're, that you're managing. So when we think about just husbandry, I'm, I'm a, I always like looking at things from this 10,000 foot perspective. So when I look at pastured or domestic, excuse me, pastured or these conventional systems or backyard systems, whatever it is, that the basics are really what we want to focus on. And, you know, the acronym that, that, that we came up with is, is FLAWS. So, you know, you kind of want to know your flaws um, or reduce your flaws, whatever, you, however you want to think about it. 
But the basics are, if you can do this, if you can uh, feed birds, if you can provide light, if you can um, provide good air, um, reduce um, um, a particulate matter in the air, clean water, adequate space, and good sanitation. If you can just do those six things as best as you can, whether they're chicks, whether they're uh, laying hens, whether they're <clears throat> broilers or turkeys, whether it's a pastured system, conventional system, and everything in between, if you can just do these, just focus on these, then um, I, I think you'll go a long way toward having a healthy, productive um, uh, flock of birds, uh, whatever system you use. And, and ultimately, you know, I, I'm not going to talk too much about the different breeds, but I did want to mention that, um, you know, just in general for, you know, it's kind of interesting. So birds have been domesticated as chickens for seven, 8,000 years or so. And up until the last 100 years or so, we didn't really have broilers, i.e. meat birds, layers, i.e. chickens that, that are hens that produce eggs, and these kind of hybrid type of birds. For, for, for most of history, we just had chickens, and, and most of them actually originally were for fighting purposes. So it's really important, depending on what system you're using, and I'm just going to go back a little, whether you're in these conventional systems or these pastured systems, it's really important that you look at all kinds of different variables, and you can have a whole talk about this, or you could talk about, well, is your goal meat? Is your goal eggs? What's your climate? Uh, what latitude are you at? Because birds will molt um, depending on how much light they're exposed to, but some breeds aren't as uh, sensitive to that as other breeds. And, you know, the basics, when you're thinking about, you know, kind of moving into these type of systems, whether you're just a farmer um, who grows crops and now wants to move into poultry, um, you got to start with these kind of basic questions and there's all kinds of good resources. Like you can start with me and then we can talk about, you know, some of the different genetic strains that are available. Um, but, but we've done some surveys and I, I'm going to go over um, in a little, just some of the results that we've, that we've got when we talk to the actual farmers. Um, also just the basics on your flaws, you know, you want to think about, you know, feeding and watering. And I just want to point out there, there are, as we all know, there's, there's more than one way to feed and water our chickens. Um, the most important part is to reduce spillage for all kinds of reasons. We want to reduce feed spillage and water spillage um, because it's wasteful. Um, we want to reduce feed and water spillage because it costs more. And we also want to reduce feed and water spillage because those are the kinds of things that attract wildlife, rodents, waterfowl. And waterfowl, as we all know, are the primary reservoir of avian influenza. And we're dealing with a major avian influenza outbreak right now. So um, whatever system you use, um, it really comes down to not the feeder that you're using, not the water that you're using, but are you are you managing it correctly? So being having that fastidious nature is really important and asking questions and paying attention. Um, so I want to talk just a little about disease. Um, and um, I just want to mention just a couple basics of how chickens do get sick. So chickens can get sick from insects and wildlife, which carry salmonella, for example, and other bacteria. And the insects, you know, uh, go to where the feed is, where the moisture is, um, and they can mechanically transmit or, or they, they can transmit these, these different bacteria into the birds because um, the, the bacteria is actually carried on the insect um, or the wildlife is carrying it and the wildlife poops and then the chickens eat, eat the poop. Um, so you can also have diseases transmitted through the environment. So through soil, through water, things like that, um, feed and, and, and water. You can also get diseases from your hatchery. So it's really, really, really important when you order chicks, whatever you order, whether they're freedom rangers, whether they're, you know, whatever breed that you're ordering, it's just really important to make sure that the hatchery in a perfect world is part of what we call the NPIP, National Poultry Improvement Plan, because those NPIP approved hatcheries do some level of biosecurity, some level of uh, disease surveillance um, that gives you some level of security about um, making sure that the chicks that you're getting are, 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 are disease free. It's not perfect, but definitely better than non NPIP hatcheries. Um, also, the litter, the material that the birds are raised on, they can transmit disease that way. And finally, humans um, are the primary transmitter via um, fomites, and fomites are basically just inorganic um, objects that we use that can transmit disease. So 
For example, shoes are these great fomites because we use those same shoes sometimes in our feed store or our neighbor's flock. And then we go right back into our flock. And now on the bottom of our shoes, we've transmitted disease into our flock. So it's really, really important as humans um, to reduce the spread of disease via fomites, tires, shovels, farm equipment, all those type of things um, can, can transmit diseases, including avian influenza. And then workers. So us, we're workers. So um, it's really important that, that anyone that works with poultry um, is adequately trained and understands how disease can be transmitted because diseases can be transmitted not just into our bird, but also into our eggs. And the two ways that we can transmit disease into our eggs is that um, the mom and dad can have the disease. And then the, um, the, the chick, even before it's hatched, um, is has a disease like Salmonella enteritidis, which is the one that makes uh, you and I as humans sick, or um, the the eggs, the the eggs that we're consuming, for example, um, can be exposed to Salmonella enteritidis through fecal material. And as we all know, eggs are porous, so now that Salmonella can actually end up in the egg and now um, potentially sicken us. So uh, all kinds of different ways for us to get sick and. Um, Right now, as many of you know, we're dealing with a major outbreak of avian influenza, um, a highly pathogenic strain of avian influenza. There's actually been a, a human in Colorado who was working with some poultry that had some mild clinical signs and tested positive for the same strain of highly pathogenic avian influenza that's killing millions of birds. Now, that person is going to make a full recovery, um, but it's important for us to realize that these uh, avian influenza, some of them can be zoonotic, meaning that some of them actually, um, not so much in North America historically, but some of them, especially in Asia, can um, eventually uh, be um, uh, sick in humans and, and, and it, in, in, in addition can actually cause death in, in some humans. Very rare, but it does happen. And I, I did want to point out that the time of year that we are in right now, um, all of these waterfowl are moving back up into the Arctic and uh, for, for, for raising their young, um, their young chicks. Um, and um, they will be back again in the fall. And there's this kind of migratory pattern. And uh, right now we're dealing with, oh my God, it's uh, tens of millions of, of poultry that have had to be depopulated um, across 29 different states. And uh, it's really important if we dabble and start moving into poultry production, whatever system we're using, it's really important that we um, reduce um, the risk of transmission from waterfowl to domestic poultry. Um, and this just more than anything just shows that in California, where a lot of us are located, that even our non-migratory waterfowl um, can carry avian influenza um, and, and the migratory waterfowl that are moving down the, the West Coast every fall that move back into the Arctic uh, every spring and summer, um, that those birds um, carry avian influenzas and we get new versions of these viruses every year. And it's important that we realize that these new versions, we don't know what we're dealing with. Some of them are highly pathogenic, meaning that by definition, they kill a lot of birds. Some of them are low pathogenic, which still kills a lot of birds, um, but, but as the definition implies, not as many. Um, so I don't, I'm kind of going to gloss over this side slide, but the main way the virus is spread is through fecal material. And these uh, waterfowl will, will poop that into all kinds of environments, and then it'll spread uh, eventually, uh, unfortunately, into domestic animals. And waterfowl are unique in the sense that for the most part, they do not show clinical signs of disease, but domestic poultry absolutely um, share, uh, show clinical signs of disease, especially those highly pathogenic strains. So um, one thing I just wanted to mention, we talked about how in the, in the fall and this upcoming fall from, from some of the disease modeling um, that our partners at USGS are doing uh, with our lab. Uh, we've kind of learned that, that we're, we're potentially expecting some, some very um, significant um, uh, impact to the Pacific Flyway where we are. We've been, knock on wood, extremely lucky so far, and we haven't had a huge impact 
um, in California, uh, as far as we know, no impact in California from highly pathogenic avian influenza that's, that's affecting all the commercial birds in the Midwest. But I, I just want people to be aware uh, this fall, and uh, we, we, we might that might not be the case. So it's important right now for us to prepare, uh, especially if we're going to have poultry or we're thinking about have, having poultry. It's really important for us to prepare for that um, for that scenario. Okay, and the last thing I want to mention is that there's no cures. We don't have treatments for for these kind of diseases and most poultry diseases. So uh, I always like this uh, this cartoon, and it just shows all the all the different treatments for, for poultry. And then the medicine cabinet's pretty bare. In California, we can't use sieve and dust anymore um, to treat uh, ectoparasites, it's, it's illegal. So now really the only treatments we have, this is you know a little of a exaggeration here, it's a cartoon, but my point is biosecurity and prevention are the best ways, good husbandry, those are the best ways that we can reduce diseases uh, moving into our, into our poultry as opposed to uh, looking for any kind of treatments. And I'm, I'm going to say this half jokingly, but apple cider vinegar, uh, if you look at the literature, the apple cider vinegar does not cure any, any poultry or, or other animal disease as far as I know. I've not seen any literature that supports that, even though when you go online and social media, apparently apple cider vin vinegar fixes everything. Um, so these alternative systems, so what we're talking about today um, I want to talk about some of the challenges with them. Um, they're amazing systems, and the farmers that work on these systems, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of work over the years with these different types of pasture and integrative farmers um, along the West Coast. And like I said, most of them don't just do poultry. Most of them have a farm enterprise that covers crops, uh, some livestock, and they kind of dabble in poultry. And the reason they really like poultry um, is because the poultry um, you know, is, is kind of a, a showstopper when, when it gets to, for their CSA box or for a farmer's market. But it's really important just to understand that these, these systems do have some challenges. And um, if you look on our website, um, and Myrna might be able to, to find the link and, and put it in the chat box, but if you look for the actual articles, but if you look on, on our, this website, I just wanted to mention what some of the typical challenges that producers have. And these are typically producers that have, you know, flocks in the hundreds or thousands. So these are relatively small flocks. Um, and they have a lot of issues, right? And, and, and our goal is to work with them to try to optimize and reduce those issues. But feed, which is 70% of the operating cost of raising a typical flock of bird, that's the big issue. So they're not big enough to have their own feed mill typically. Um, they're not big enough to get an economy of scale when they work with a feed mill, like a large uh, commercial conventional poultry producer. So that creates, you know, they're in this middle ground where they, they, they can't really kind of realize some of the economies of scale and feed is very expensive, especially now for all the reasons that we know, supply chain issues, war, um, climate change, you know, feed prices are very volatile. And ultimately the most expensive part of the feed is protein. So you pay back twice as much for protein. So the really, really large commercial poultry facilities, they can get three, four, five different rations to really dial in how much protein they need. If you go to these farms, we have two rations, right? We have a chick ration and we have a layer ration. Uh, we have a chick ration and we have a a broiler ration. So we don't have as much flexibility. And in some cases we're paying more because we are having too much protein, but there's no way to really dial that in exactly how we want it dialed in. So that feed issue is a real challenge. And, and then there's, you know, I think an opportunity uh, for, for as, these, as these farms get larger and larger, or as we get more and more of them, I think there's an opportunity for some feed mills to kind of cater to those type of, of producers, but it's a challenge. Um, and, and, there are, and there are options, but you just have to go a little further away um, you have to do some vetting for some of the different uh, mills that are around. And, you know, when you're choosing farm locations, choosing a farm that's close geographically to a mill is, is a really, really important um, decision. Uh, lack of processing facilities, that looked like that was the second most uh, uh, common operational challenge. Um, and that basically means how are you going to process your meat? So processing broilers is a lot of work. 
Um, there are all kinds of regulatory hurdles and opportunities to do that yourself, but processing it yourself is a lot of work um, and it's, it can be a little exhausting. But if you go to a, a commercial processor and have them process the birds for you, you're paying. We just had 140 birds processed uh, uh, for our, um, that, 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 uh, our pasture poultry system for, as part of an experiment. And it was seven dollars a bird to process, and that's gone up a lot in, in cost. I think previously we probably paid like four or five dollars. Um, so processing is a challenge. Um, the third thing is, uh, and I'm just going to go over the top three, top four is uh, navigating regulations. So poultry has a lot of regulations. The water board, if you live in the Central Valley, is going to want to know about the density of your birds. Um, if you have three thousand laying hens. Um, 3,000 or more laying hens, then the California and the FDA are going to want you to do salmonella and teriditis testing. So those are the kinds of things that someone like myself or, or someone else, uh, a commercial poultry veterinarian can help you out with. But regulations can be challenging. Um, and then the last thing is managing predation. So predators are, if you look at our, our number one cause of mortality, predation seems to be the number one issue that these um, um, producers are dealing with. And it gets really complicated because most people don't count the number of birds they have. And if a raptor comes by and picks off a bird, in many cases, you don't even know that you don't even notice that that bird is gone. And now you're feeding the same amount of exact amount of feed. And now you're not getting eggs from, you know, one or two or three, you know, extra birds. So that predation issue is really, really challenging to deal with in these pastured systems because like I said, in many cases, you don't realize until, you know, much later sometimes that you're having, um, why, why is your egg production going down? Is it because of predation or is there a disease or are, is, are they at a stage in a flock where their, their, their egg production is going down? And a lot of people, it's very hard for these producers to kind of capture all the, those data in a, in a, in a quick um, kind of fashion. You can see some of the other challenges they have. Um, so that kind of leads to... So I really focus on data um, and the commercial conventional producers are pretty good at collecting data. They don't do very much with it. I always joke with some of the producers that they're like the national security agency. They collect tons of data. They don't do very much with it. Um, but the pasture producers, they're in a challenging situation because a lot of these folks, um, I have all the respect for in the world. They're working 60, 70 hours a week. They don't take vacation or anything like that. And they're always, they're unable to really, you know, kind of collect data. Um, so there are ways using Google Forms, for example, to collect data and do it very, very easily. And then on a weekend or at night, um, you can do some sorting and, and ranking and, and just make sure that you're getting the amount of eggs that you're expecting to get. Um, when you buy your chicks from a genetics company like Highline, for example, um, or you buy your Red Rangers from the feed store, um, or whatever hatchery you're working with, there should be some level of, of productivity that you're anticipating with respect to uh, feed conversion ratio or um, um, the amount of eggs that you're going to get in, that, in that, that bird's lifespan. All those things should be kind of, there, there should be kind of a baseline measurement that you're aiming for. And uh, collecting those data gives you at least an indication about how close you are to that. So uh, collecting data is important, but it's challenge, and sometimes it's a bridge too far for a lot of these producers. Um, so just going through some of the different systems that we've tried, we've been really lucky at UC Davis with a lot of really clever engineering students, and uh, you know half of the stuff they do I, I can never do in a million years. But we've gone through so many different iterations of coops, and I'm always impressed when I'm talking to pastured and, and free range type producers, you know, all the different systems they've tried. Um, I do wanna highlight a couple things here. Uh, fencing is, is so key, even if it's not, you know, kind of covering the entire location, um, having some version of a mobile fence that's electrified by, by some kind of battery, um, that has, we've been very successful keeping our birds in, um, not always keeping, you know, raptors and things out, but the birds are pretty clever. And if you look at this structure here with the PVC pipe, um, I'll be walking around like a clueless human and I'll see all the birds kind of start hiding under there. And then I'll look up and, you know, a couple of seconds later, I'll see a raptor or something coming. 
So the birds are smart. You just have to give them opportunities to protect themselves and they will typically protect themselves. Um, if you talk to some of the welfare uh, specialists like uh, Richard Blotch from the Animal Science Department, he'll, he'll tell you that there's some value even though um, um, roosters don't produce eggs for obvious reasons, but there is some value in having a rooster or two sometimes in your flock um, because the rooster will take it upon themselves to protect the rest of the of the hens. So, um, and they will stand up to to all kinds of ra all kinds of different predators, including raccoons um, um, and other you know kind of wolves and, and things like that. Um, here's the other coop that we built. The only disadvantage of this coop this this coop is obviously not going anywhere, even though we had some really epic windstorms in Davis a year or two ago, and this thing got absolutely destroyed. Um, but, but under normal conditions in California, these things are great. Um, the only problem is you need a tractor to move it now, unless you just keep it in that one spot and you don't move it, which is what we did because the weld that we had for the, the hitch was, was not that good. Um, but this system, uh, the things I want to highlight here is uh, we put the, the, the nest boxes are on the inside, but we can collect the eggs on the outside. So if you build like five or 10 of these, like a lot of farms will, you're saving yourself tons of time and aggravation by putting these, these nest boxes, the, the retrieval system on the outside. Um, so that's good. We had an automatic door here. So the birds will learn um, in the morning, they'll go out and at night, they'll, as, as dusk settles in, um, we set the automatic door to close You know, half an hour after dusk and they all go in. You still want a human to come there at night just to make sure that there's no stragglers, uh, but you can automate a lot of this stuff. And this, like I was showing you earlier, uh, these curtains, we can vent, we can, we can turn them, we can pull them up or pull them down, um, just depending on what kind of ventilation and what kind of temperatures we're, we're aiming for. Uh, water is always a pain, and I'm not going to talk too much about water here, but here's a trough that's, uh, here's a trough down here that's gravity fed by this barrel. Um, and that worked pretty well, not great, um, but, but pretty well. Water can be a challenge. Here's just another system we, we attempted. Um, here's a farm that we worked with in the Capay Valley. Um, so um, it, we used plywood here um, instead of this wire. There's advantages and disadvantages to each system. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I, I do wanna highlight um, that, that there are advantages and disadvantages. And, and you know, plywood's expensive. Plywood does not hold up to mother nature very well. You gotta replace it. Um, but um, these wires, you know, they, they, they can um, cause, in, in some cases, um, some kind of foot problems, bumblefoot, because it seems to be a little more common in these type of scenarios. Um, and then these birds are all roosting. And then you have birds that are underneath here and poop can fall on those birds. And from some of our data analysis, that seems to be a higher risk factor um, for uh, salmonella enteritis in, in, the, in the birds. But um, again, I, I don't think we're, I don't wanna be prescriptive and say, do this or don't do this. It's just something that you have to be aware of more than anything at this point. Um, this is this uh, other coop that I previously showed you. This was an aluminum um, frame, and we took a good idea of making the coops really light and easily movable to an extreme idea. So they were so, the kind of uh, aluminum um, um, frame that we used was too light and the structures weren't, weren't stable enough for us. Um, and here you can see again, those, those canvas things that the birds will hide under when there's some raptors and, and other birds out. This one, there's always you know, a troublemaker or two that jumps the, um, the fence, um, doesn't always pay attention. But for the most part, this kind of system, having a coop that the birds go into at night with some kind of automatic door, having uh, the feeders and waters out during the day and away at night, uh, having this secondary fence here, some version of that um, is, is, seems to be kind of a winner. The nice thing about these PVC pipes uh, structures that we made. These are so light and so easy to move. And then we just put some um, um, some kind of cloth, I'm forgetting the name of the cloth that we're using on the top there, that just uh, kind of shade cloth. That's what we're, we're using on the top here. Um, that being said, we did use hardware cloth here. If you've ever worked with hardware cloth, it's awesome. Uh, rodents and things like that can't get through it if you get the quarter inch type. Uh, raccoons are, are, are going to have real difficulty um, um, cutting through it. But your students and yourself uh, are gonna get scratched um, really badly by that stuff. So just be careful with it. Um, here is our Cadillac um, coupe. So we actually um, had a clever hey, engineering Maurice. student. Yeah. Maurice, sorry to interrupt. Can you um, wrap it up in a couple minutes? Yeah, absolutely, so sorry. Questions? 
Yep, so this is our Cadillac. We, we actually built this in Nepal using bamboo, um, but this one, uh, light, easily movable, all those good things. So um, just wanted to highlight that. You always want a place you can stick, stick sick birds. So having a separate coop area where if you notice one or two birds are coughing or wheezing or you got some new birds, put them in that quarantine pen uh, for seven to 10 days before you introduce them to the rest of the flock. Here I said 30 days, but let's do seven to 10 is, is kind of our, our middle ground there. Um, predators are a real challenge. And I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately gonna say, I don't want to burst anyone's bubbles, but you know, people always want to use propane cannons and lasers and electronics and, and the reality and, and, and coyote decoys and balloons and all those kind of things. But the reality is fencing. That's that's the one that works the best. The other ones, eh, they don't work great. I'm just gonna say that off the top of, of from, from our experience. But I know people love lasers. I love lasers too, but they don't work great, is my experience. There's just another paper that I need to read that just got published on that. Um, having some level, again, that fomite issue is so important. So whenever you want to use a pair of old jeans that's dedicated to your coop, do something, but, but you can't use the same equipment, same shoes um, when you're going to the feed store than when you go um, are treating your birds. And um, the last couple comments, I'm going to go through that. We talked about the shade structure. Um, these repellent tapes, we've tried those. Eh, I know they use them on a lot of grapevines and things like that. And, you know, we didn't obviously go aggro and put them everywhere and have them blowing in the wind, which might scare raptors, for example. Um, but but I was I was a little underwhelmed by that. Uh, the coyote decoys, great for, for scaring students. Um, but the fence behind it is actually going to be the better one. And the coyote decoys only work if you keep on moving them every, you know, couple hours or so. Because, you know, coyotes and, and, and other predators are really smart. Like raccoons are not just going to look at a coyote decoy and just see it sitting there and, and not be afraid of it. Um, so fencing, 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 fencing. And then um, we talked about the electric fencing. And then the last quick thing I was going to mention, uh, these, um, um, and I can't remember the name of the breed, Myrna, if you can remember, please put it in the chat box. But um, there are some really good breeders. Um, if you can get a hold of them, they that that there's some amazing dogs that'll that'll have all kinds of of protective um, abilities um, and won't um, go after the chickens for the most part, which is really amazing. And I've heard really good things. There's one breeder, I think like Idaho or Montana, that I heard some really good things about. So that'll take any questions that people have. And, and sorry for not leaving a ton of time for questions. Mm -hmm.